Well, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, George for inviting me today. Uh, the Richmond Gulf is a very special place. On some of my trips, we came across archaeologists, and I thought I would start with a little human history of the Richmond Gulf. Uh, there are three different cultures recognized. Uh, Pre-Dorset, Dorset, and Thule. There were three... There were pre-Dorset people living at the Gullet about 4,000 years ago. The tides rushing in and out of the Gullet prevent the water from freezing and make it a desirable habitat. They live in tents and snow houses and use harpoons to hunt seals. Walruses and small whales from skin-covered boats. They also hunted a variety of land mammals. The culture became extinct about 2,800 years ago as a result of food shortages and colder climatic conditions. The earliest Dorset sites are elevated 55 meters above the present sea level, indicating that the land was much higher then. The Belcher Islands in Hudson Bay were mostly underwater during the pre-Dorset period. The Dorset people between 2,500 and 500 years ago had a more successful life. They lived in more permanent houses built of snow and turf and heated with seal oil soapstone lamps. They were capable of taking animals as large as walruses and narwhals and possibly bowhead whales, but did little hunting of land mammals. And this is a map of the Gulf, and I think, I'm not sure how this works, but... Oh, there we go. Um, up here is Umiwak and the airport, and there's a road through there to the top of the Gulf. This is all the Gulf in here. And the gullet is where the tide flows in and out and where these habitations were. Uh, one on the north here and one out here. Cairn Island is where there was a Hudson Bay post and a Richmond Fort, which was built in 1740. And there was another Hudson Bay post established here later on. Uh, in other words, all the southern end has quite a history. Um, the Dor Dorset sites uh, are no located near the entrance here and in here, as I mentioned. The Dorsets at the Gullet had contact with Norse settlers, as evidenced by the discovery of a harpoon of European origin in a Dorset house in Carbon dated about 860 years ago, or 600 years before Europeans so-called discovered it. We visited that site. Climate warming facilitated an expansion of Alaskan Eskimos across Arctic Canada some 800 years ago, bringing the Thule culture. They populated the Hudson Bay coast and brought with them a sophisticated sea hunting technology that they had developed in the Bering Sea. The Thule are directly ancestral to the present Inuit who now live in Umiwak. And now for the Europeans. The Europeans arrived in 1744. Uh, competition with the French in James Bay prompted the Hudson Bay Company to explore northward and establish trade with the Inuit. An expedition led by Captain William Coates in 1749 explored and charted the Richmond Gulf and selected the site for Richmond Fort on Cairn Island, which is, I think I showed you it, but it's right down in here. And this is the chart that William Coates uh, drew up 
he toured all around the shore and uh, tried to produce a, a reasonable map of it. We visited the site of the fort. However, the Inuit may have considered consider the traitors to be allies, uh, enemies, and in 1754, Inuit ransacked the summer outpost at the Little Whale River, south of Richmond Gulf, and killed a young HBC employee. Two Inuit were later killed. In 1758, the Richmond Gulf Post was dismantled and moved to Little Whale River, where it closed the following year for lack of trade. And it took 162 years later, uh, the HBC came back to Cairn Island, and in 1922, Reveillon Frere built a post beside them. And this is the post on Cairn Island, established by Reveillon Frere. And right next door to Reveillon was the Hudson Bay Company, and unfortunately I don't have any pictures of it. <clears throat> so we're going to take a look at the Gulf. Uh, I made two trips there, one in 2000 and whatever that says, nine, <laughs> and one in 2012 with uh, George Lister. Uh, the first trip was with Bob Henderson and a group of his uh, friends. And uh, we got windbound for, it was a seven day trip and we got windbound for about three or four days. So we didn't get very far down the Gulf. Anyway, I provided a map. Whoops, I'm going too fast here. Yeah, I'm using the wrong thing. I provided a map here with a little red dot to show where we are in each slide, or almost each slide. So this is our first night at the mouth of the Riviera de Nord, setting up a mosquito sort of tarp, and uh, we had a lot of fun in it with the mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, this is a little further down the Gulf. Uh, we had relatively nice weather. It wasn't too windy, and uh, we're all enjoying the first day of the trip. A little further down, and uh, we actually crossed from over here this way and there was no wind at all, but when we got to the other side, the wind had picked up. And here we are for about four days. Uh, we finally put up a little tarp here, and you can see the wind is pretty strong. Uh, with the loaded canoes, it wasn't a good idea to canoe. Anyway, we finally made it a, a little further down, uh, and we found a very nice campsite on a point. Uh, just behind this mountain here. And uh, those are some views from that area. And we climbed the mountain, and I'm not going to even try to uh, <laughs> read it for you. <laughs> um, uh, this is uh, behind the, uh, the top of the mountain. There's a few little freshwater lakes there, and uh, very sort of tiger-like conditions. Uh, anyway, finally we were rescued by the Inuit in their freighter canoes and taken back to, uh, 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 back to Yumuak. Um, so this is as far down as we got. We only did this little bit. And uh, it was foggy and the plane couldn't come in to take us out. So we spent the night in the airport lobby. <laughs> Uh, courtesy of Air Inuit, who uh, actually also brought us some some food, which was very nice. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Bob Henderson's book, and it uh, goes along with Dave Freeman's presentation last night. I, I'm a school board commissioner. I've been a school board commissioner for about 38 years now in Quebec, and uh, I believe that every uh, school child, school uh, students should get out into the wilderness one week each year as part of their education. 
Thank you. This is the uh, second trip, uh, which was last year for 11 days. Uh, the people that were on it, some of them are in the audience. Some of them are organizers of the event. <laughs> anyway, we landed in uh, Yumiwak up here. <coughs> that's the uh, that's the airport, Yumiwak. That's the school. It's quite a nice school. And this is the road from the airport to the town, which is down in here. And the road was paved, uh, which is quite something. Um, anyway, here we are uh, putting our pack canoes together. Uh, at the, uh, we've driven over the, the road, and uh, we're putting our pack canoes together. <coughs> and we're, we paddled out. And uh, there was lunch, I guess, on the first day, and some of the topography, and so on that we encountered. Uh, and this was our second campsite. We uh, went to shore here, and you can just see our tents in the foreground here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful sight. And we went just a little further from there down to here the next day and camped at the same spot that uh, we camped on our last night with Bob Henderson up on top. And uh, we, there were some bear tracks and so on. We saw a few bears. And then the wind came up. <laughs> but <clears throat> we weren't windbound for very long, but I wrote something about the wind. I'm going to read it to you. The wind is from the west-northwest, so it will help us as we proceed southward. This is a good thing, but it will not be directly behind us and will require some strong stern paddling strokes. Not a good thing. George's barometer is rising, indicating better weather, but doesn't provide any information about the wind. It would be possible to wait on the shore until the wind drops, perhaps a good idea, but it just isn't bad enough to do that. Not now, not yet. So we leave the shore in anticipation of the wind dying down. We are anxious, hesitant, and maybe a little fearful of what may lie ahead. The wind doesn't die down. It picks up, and the waves grow bigger. The windward white caps are everywhere. I try to keep the canoe close to shore, but we must head out if we want to reach the next island on our course. <clears throat> the clouds come and go, moving fast. The rocky shore appears in many different hues as the clouds clear and return. On the other side to windward, I see a major white cap approaching. The wind is lifting spray from its crest and blowing it towards us. Get ready. It isn't easy being a stern person. I experiment by placing the canoe at various angles to the wind on each wave to see which angle keeps the most water out. But every wave is different, and I come to the conclusion that I should just try to keep the boat afloat on a reasonably straight course. Occasionally, a gust of wind lurches the boat sideways, knocking us off balance, and we both know enough to do a quick paddle brace and bend our bodies forward to lower our center of gravity, don't we? <laughs> we hope that the other crews know enough to do the same. My bow partner is relatively ignorant of what goes on behind her. But the big waves and strong wind alarm her. She also knows that we can't stop. To stop would make it more difficult for me and her to keep the canoe lined up with the wind. I glance over my shoulder and see the other three canoes bouncing along well behind us. We must look like a snake crawling over the waves, up and down, right and left, bobbing, moving slowly, but no mosquitoes. <laughs> Finally, the island arrives, as George would put it. We can continue on its lee side to find a place to land and wait for the others. 
There is beauty in everything. So, uh, we're moving down now. Uh, yeah, we camped right in here, and this is this camp site that's at the mouth of the Clearwater River. And uh, then we paddled a little further to an island here. It was very windy across here also, so we stopped, and uh, we were actually windbound on that little point for, uh, oh, maybe uh, seven or eight hours, I guess. And then we paddled out to this island and camped on that. We, pat we had dinner first and then paddled out there in the evening. So this is very short of that. And uh, I've got something about trees. Uh, you know, of course, the trees talk to us. I'm a forester. I can vouch for that. I like all trees, from the small ones to the big ones, like these two. Happy and healthy, young ones wave at you, and they cry when they are sick or sad. The old ones know and tell us when their time is up. I thank them for the joy and beauty they have brought to me and all of us. There is so much to learn from nature, if only we look and listen. So, we're now down at the second or third Hudson Bay post down here. It's a nice sandy beach, that's the post. And uh, that's, we're having breakfast down here. Uh, this is a uh, photo that I got from the uh, Amatak Cultural Institute of, uh, that's Willie, Willie Kammerluck, who I met a number of times up there, and uh, digging for whatever they can find. Uh, and this is uh, just a few pictures from the Cultural Institute of the Hudson Bay Post. Uh, in 2004 and 2010. And this was the inside of the post in uh, 2005. Uh, so now we're paddling uh, out uh, and along toward Cairn Island. Uh, some of us had a swim and some of us went hiking at some point. <laughs> Now we're at Cairn Island, and we arrived when there was an uh, archaeological group there uh, at the site of the Richmond Fort. And uh, these were the, the digs, and uh, the archaeologists were very keen to explain to us what was going on, what they were doing, what they were finding, and it was really interesting to listen to them. Um, this is the after we left, uh, the uh, archaeologists took some pictures and I happened to get a hold of them. And these are some of the digs a little later on. And this is the Richmond Fort, the bastion, uh, one of the bastions of the Richmond Fort after we had left. They dug up quite a few more stones and uh, they could put together uh, what the whole thing looked like. Um, Although uh, three bastions could not be located, the missing foundation walls of the southwest bastion was identified, revealing its trapezoidal shape and some structural remains of the workshops, including a wooden floor, posts, and some fire bricks, clay tobacco pipe fragments, green wine bottles, and ceramic shards of early stoneware, earthenware, and oriental porcelain were recovered, as well as building hardware and various blacksmith tools. So they did have a very uh, profitable stay there. Uh, this is CBC Radio interviewing the project members for a documentary on the French CBC channel. Uh, if you go to the CBC web webs website, you can still uh, take a look at that uh, it's a very short uh, documentary, but it's still on their website. Anyway, so we camped right near the archaeologist campsite, and there's a few more pictures. Uh, 
We had really good uh, weather from here on in. Um, the temperature went up to 35 degrees Celsius, uh, and uh, the mosquitoes came out. <laughs> Uh, here we are taking a pee break <laughs> on the way into the Gulf. That's heading into the Gulf, a little more wind. Uh, and this is our campsite in the Gulf, uh, right in here. And uh, we also, uh, of course, we had a happy hour and uh, we had a happy George. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is the gullet from further up, uh, looking across, uh, quite a scenic spot. And uh, right in here are, there are two different um, uh, Dorset sites where the uh, Dorset had camps. Uh, they had uh, seal skin over whale bone tents. And uh, the people at the entrances, they crawled in under a stone uh, to get inside. And these are probably about 800 years old. Uh, and very interesting, there's more of these up there too. And they're quite high up on the hill because the water, the land level was uh, much lower than, or the sea level was much higher, whatever. <laughs> Anyway, two more slides of uh, nice calm weather paddling. And uh, we left the gullet to take advantage of the tide to get out here and we had breakfast on the point here. And then the same day we paddled up this far and uh, no wind at all, very hot. I had to put off cooking dinner until about seven o'clock because of the heat. Uh, and that's another campsite. We're now up here uh, on our way home. We had a canoe seat that broke and we repaired it. Nothing major happens all the time. <laughs> and uh, one more shot. And that's it. Thank you.